just a couple of more checks before we begin. Thanks for tuning in. We're you're watching uh, Virtual D Day from Wheel of Normandy. It's mm, a few seconds past seven p.m. I'm just doing a couple more checks before we begin. Okay, well, hello everybody and welcome back to Normandy. I'm Patrick Hillier and this is Virtual D-Day from WeLoveNormandy.com. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a D-Day guide and a member of the Normandy Battlefield Tour Guides Association. And since June of 2020, I've been doing video webinars like this one and live on location virtual D-Day tours from the beaches and battlefields of Normandy. My company also provides transport, accommodation and private guided tours here in Normandy and this March I'll be touring with a group of virtual D-Day subscribers, some of whom I'm sure are tuning in this, uh, this evening, uh, on our first real D-Day tour, so we're looking forward to that. I'll be doing these video webinars every month, uh, usually on Wednesdays, as well as the regular Zoom meetings that we call the Zoom Platoon. Uh, by the way, today's Zoom platoon starts after this virtual tour ends. Um, to join the Zoom, you need to be a paid subscriber or have purchased a ticket or a donation ticket. Either way, you should have received a link to the Zoom meeting. If you haven't received that link, don't worry. Um, uh, send me an email to let me know that you haven't got it and I will email you, you with the link before the Zoom starts after the tour. I'll send you the details. If you'd like to be able to join all of our Zoom events, keep informed about forthcoming virtual tours, uh, if you'd like to catch up and download previous events or take part in a real D-Day tour, uh, just click on the subscribe link on the website. You can sign up for as little as three euros. There's a 30 day free trial. There's no minimum sign up period and you can cancel your subscription at any time. And uh, that, uh, that reminds me, uh, I'd like to say a, a big thank you to everybody who's joined us today. Um, and uh, I'm just checking some of the messages coming in today. So uh, good evening, Magnus from, uh, from Sweden. That's great, to, uh, great that you've tuned in from, from Sweden. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so I'd like to say thank you to all of our viewers tonight, but especially to my VIPs, that's my very important patrons. Uh, and here's the list. Vicky, Anne-Marie, Ben, Sue, Jacqueline, Barb, Laurie, Susan, Peter, Lisa, and wait for it, Midget Models. Uh, thank you all for your support and many thanks to all my other paid subscribers without whose support I could not run these virtual tours and webinars. So today, uh, Omaha Beach and Point du Hoc will begin four miles to the west of Omaha Beach at Point du Hoc. Uh, the place that you can see uh, on the horizon there on the on the video panel. Uh, we'll visit the D1 draw at uh, Viaville sur mer Let me just get rid of the text that we have here now. Um, and, uh, and we'll end the tour right in the middle of Omaha Beach at the D3 draw at Les Moulins. If we get time, um, uh, which I think we should be okay. We'll have a look at the opening sequences of the movie Saving Private Ryan while we're there at the D D1 draw where the film was set or where those opening sequences were set. And you can take part in this week's three question quiz, which today is on the theme of D-Day personalities. I'll reveal the answers to the quiz at the end. So please stay tuned. So without further delay, let's begin. This is Omaha Beach, the bloodiest of the five Allied invasion beaches. The invasion, codenamed Operation Overlord, was the largest air and sea invasion in history. Uh, D-Day brought 156,000 Allied troops to the beaches and fields of Normandy on June the 6th, 1944. And those who arrived here in the Omaha sector saw some of the fiercest fighting. Now nobody knows for sure, but only between 350 and 700 enemy troops were at their posts uh, on Omaha Beach 
here on the morning of D-Day. And they were facing the US Five Corps invasion force of 34,000 men. And now once ashore, those men had to advance to the villages inland via only five exits off the beach. These valleys, or draws, D-R-A-W, were the only gaps in the escarpment of the bluffs. Really the only exits, the only way for the troops to get off Omaha Beach. Now you can see them here on this military map. Uh, the enemy fixed positions or strong points are marked in red and that's where you see the, the exits, the road exits from the beach leading off up into the villages. Now today after visiting Point Du Hoc we'll concentrate on the western end of the beach and the two drawers that you see there, uh, one just to the right of my face, which is Vieuxville and centre left, Les Moulins at uh, uh, Dog Red Easy Green sector. Now the plan for the invasion was to launch a massive uh, aerial and naval bombardment of the German defences just before the troops landed. And then once on the beach, the armoured units, the tanks, were to destroy what remained of the enemy gun positions then the engineers would disarm and remove the beach obstacles that the Germans had, had uh, installed on the beach. And once the exits were open, the troops would make their way up those drawers on foot or in motor powered vehicles. But like a lot of what happened to Five Corps on D-Day, things did not go according to plan. In spite of outnumbering the German defenders by up to 30 to one, by the end of the day, the units of the 1st and 29th US Infantry Divisions had suffered thousands of casualties. In fact, at least 1,400 men lost their lives on Omaha Beach and many more were wounded. But uh, despite the high number of men who were killed in action, wounded, missing or taken prisoner, uh, General Jero, the commander of US 5 Corps, oversaw the successful landing of two entire divisions. 34,000 men and by the end of the day they had secured the beachhead uh, up to six miles long, liberated the three villages of Vieuxville, Saint Laurent and Colville and established a crucial front line a couple of miles behind the beach. So on today's virtual tour we will walk on Omaha Beach, we'll climb the bluffs at uh, Dog Green, uh, you can see the, the bluffs here on the, on the uh, Google Earth video and we'll learn about the challenges, setbacks and casualties faced by the US troops on the right flank of the invasion. So let's go. We'll begin not on Omaha Beach itself but four miles to the west on this uh, uh, rocky outcrop of vertical cliffs a hundred feet above a long shingle beach, this is Point Du Hoc. Now the enemy gun battery here was located on the right flank of Five Corps landing area and with its six 155mm guns it covered the largest area of sea in the sector. The whole of the US landing area was in uh, well, within range of its guns, including Omaha Beach and Utah Beach. And as you can see on this map here, the guns had a range of 10 miles, an effective um, firing range of 10 miles, which meant that both of the American beaches and the entire US fleet were well within range of the guns at Point Du Hoc. Now, the mission of securing the battery and silencing the guns was given to the recently formed US 2nd and 5th Rangers Battalions, known during the mission as the Provisional Rangers Group. Now, in command of the, uh, the PRG was Lieutenant Colonel James Earl Rudder. His mission with three companies of the 2nd Rangers was to hit the Shingle Beach at HR 6.30 a.m scale the cliffs using ladders, ropes and grappling hooks, subdue the enemy gunners and of course destroy the six heavy artillery pieces plus two um, anti-aircraft guns. Quite a mission. Now you can see the positions of the six uh, big guns. There were uh, 
155mm First World War French guns actually uh, on this official map. Now during the night before the invasion British Air Force Lancaster bombers dropped over 1,600 bombs on this 150-acre site. Um, and at just before 6 a.m., the guns of the U.S. battleship Texas fired 226 shells on Point du Hoc. Um, and then just before H hour, U.S. Army Air Force uh, B-26 Marauders, and you can see them there on this photograph uh, doing it, uh, were scheduled to drop a further 16 tons of bombs. Now, unfortunately, uh, the planes themselves arrived 15 minutes late, but lucky for Rudder and his men, they were late as well, because otherwise they would have been underneath this bombardment and suffered terrible so-called friendly fire casualties. Anyway, in all, 2,000 tonnes of munitions were dropped on Point du Hoc, and this accounts for the extraordinary lunar landscape of cratered fields that surround it. Uh, still visible today, especially from the air. You can see them on the, um, uh, on the archive uh, aerial photograph there, but also on the, uh, on the Google Earth image that you see there. So why was Rudder's task force late? Let's begin the, the VT. Well, they got lost. Um, the Rangers' 12 assault landing craft, or LCAs, and four amphibious uh, DUKWs, or ducks, I think I've got a photograph there of one of the Rudder's ducks at the foot of the cliffs. They set off from the, tr uh, the troop ships in uh, choppy seas at 4.30 a.m. Uh, the flotilla was led by a motor launch, skippered by a British Royal Navy Reserve Lieutenant called Colin Beaver. Now, unfortunately, Lieutenant Beaver mistook another point, uh, called Point de la Perse, which is a few miles to the east, for the true destination that you see in, on the, uh, in the centre of the video there. And, unfortunately, the fleet sailed badly off course. They were only half a mile from the, court, from the, from the coast when Rudder realised the error and shouted to the British skipper to turn right, goddammit. Although we can imagine that he may have used stronger language than that. Their course was corrected, but uh, they lost two LCAs, two landing craft, and suffered heavy casualties under fire from these cliffs along the three miles of the coast back to Pointe du Hoc. Now at 7.08 a.m. Rudder's 10 remaining landing craft beached on this shingle here and the, uh, the uh, Rangers wasted no time in scaling the cliffs. Navy cruisers provided close support and reduced the ferocity of the enemy's defensive fire. Some of the Rangers rocket propelled grappling hooks reached their target at the cliff top and by using uh, ladders and ropes and a huge landslide of debris which had been caused by the shelling, the troops reached the top in only five minutes. By 7.40 a.m., just half an hour or so after they'd, they'd first arrived, all of those able to bear arms were on top of the cliff. But by the time the radios were dry enough to transmit the success signal, which was praise the Lord, uh, and to call in reinforcements, it was too late. The two reinforcement companies of the 2nd Rangers Battalion uh, had been diverted along with the 5th Rangers Battalion and sent to Charlie Dog Sector on Omaha Beach. Rudder's Rangers were cut off with limited ammunition surrounded by a well-supplied enemy and they'd remain isolated until the 8th of June. Of the 225 Rangers who set off that morning for Point du Hoc, only 90 nine fighting men would be relieved two days later. And in a cruel irony, the Rangers primary objective, the six big guns, well they were not there. They'd been removed by the German forces prior to the invasion. There you see the top of the hundred foot cliff. Quite an obstacle. 
So we're going to make our way to the first uh, bunker that was um, uh, captured by by the uh, uh, by the Rangers, by Rudders Rangers. Uh, this is a 50 millimeter flak gun emplacement, uh, an anti-aircraft gun, and this uh, became uh, Colonel Rudders' command post. Um, as you can see, we we, we filmed the uh, the footage on a beautiful, clear blue, uh, beautiful uh, sunny day with a clear blue sky. But uh, if and when you come to Point Du Hoc, do bring uh, some waterproof clothing because the weather here actually on the point can change within five or ten minutes. So we are approaching the, uh, the first of the bunkers. As you can see, it's open to the, uh, it's open on the top, it's open to the sky because it's an anti-aircraft position. And uh, Rudder was using this place as his um, command post from uh, just after the, uh, the ascent of the cliffs. And as you can see in this famous photograph uh, taken on D-Day, there's Rudder and his men. You can see the American flag. That was draped on the ruins to alert the P-47 Thunderbolt fighter pilots uh, that this was friendly territory. Now you can see the, the concrete blocks, the remains of the shattered anti-aircraft battery, and they're in the archive photograph. Now underneath the bunker, in I guess the ammunition store beneath the uh, the the, uh, the flak bunker, uh, Doctor Block, the battalion's physician, set up his aid station. I'll just pause that there, and so you can see uh, again on another archive photograph. Uh, there's a U.S. Navy officer inspecting the site after the battle, and there it is today. As for the big guns, um, reports that uh, the Allies had received from the French resistance were true. They had been removed and replaced with wooden poles to deceive the Allied spotter planes into thinking that they were the barrels of the big guns uh, in place in the, uh, in the bunkers. Uh, by the way, on the day that uh, I took this footage, there was a, a film crew here filming uh, on Point Du Hoc, and they're filming just in front of one of the uh, one of the six uh, gun emplacements. And this one uh, on D-Day was still open; it was still an open gun emplacement, or, or called a, a gun pit. And we'll be talking about those shortly. So we'll leave the camera crew and carry on. Here is one of the craters that. Point du Hoc is famous for. There are hundreds of these craters. Some of them are very deep like this one. And from here we will make our way uh, to the fire control bunker right on the edge of the cliff. Now, the bunker contained a rangefinder. It didn't contain any artillery. It was uh, uh, certainly any heavy artillery. It was a rangefinder and that was used to send the coordinates of targets on the sea back to the six big guns behind. And today, as you can see, the Second Ranger's Dagger Monument stands on top of this bunker. The monument was uh, inaugurated in 1984 by um, the then President Ronald Reagan. There's the point itself. The door to this bunker was blown using plastic explosives and the occupants here at this bunker surrendered without a fight. You can see it's quite a quite a foreboding uh, structure, the, the, the bunker there, right on the edge of the cliff. And uh, here's a uh, photo, by the way, here's a photograph of the uh, inside of the bunker looking out at that incredible vista um, across the English Channel from the rangefinder inside the bunker. And by the way, that is one of the five guns that the uh, that the Rangers discovered just a mile or so south of the of, of, of Point Du Hoc uh, later on in the morning that had been removed by the Germans. Okay, and here we'll get a closer view of the Rangers monument itself. And there you see the inscription on the monument to the heroic Rangers and the, the three companies of, of the Second Rangers and uh, Rangers Battalion mentioned there. D, E and F and of course Colonel James 
Earl Rudder's name mentioned on the monument. Now from here we get a fabulous bird's eye view of the shingle strand below where the task force landing craft were beached and the cliffs where the rangers made their ascent. And here you have actually looking towards the west across the Bay de Vey towards Utah Beach which is about eight miles away on the horizon there in the very distance. Here's another one of the craters. Um, some like this one are over 20 feet deep even after seven decades and until recently until two years ago I suppose these craters were open to the public and uh, children especially like to run up and down uh, into, the, into the craters but uh, the ABMC, the American Battle Monuments Commission, who owns the site, has cordoned them off along, sadly, with most of the bunkers. Now, until 1944, uh, the six big guns had been fixed in the circular open gun pits that we saw earlier where the camera crew were, were making, their, uh, making their film. Uh, but on the lead up to D-Day, these open positions were being replaced by this. Uh, it's the new casemate style gun emplacement. Now the casemate enables the free traversal of the gun barrel uh, whilst at the same time protecting it um, from aerial bombardment and to some extent from artillery fire. The roof above the gun is six feet thick. It's steel reinforced concrete. You can see some of the damage that's been done to this one here. And the opening or embrasure is sloped to allow for the elevation of the gun. Uh, now those steps that you can see here on uh, gun number five, um, they are there to reduce the funneling of shrapnel, small arms fire or even shells that are coming uh, into the, the bunker from outside that would otherwise, otherwise they'd be concentrated inside the casemate. So it's a, a defense against uh, enemy fire. Uh, very subtle but very um, effective design feature. This one, gun number five, you can see the gun pit and you can look inside, there's no steel fixings or housings to receive the gun carriage. No guns were ever installed in these casemates. In fact, only two of the six closed bunkers, like this one, had been completed on, uh, by D-Day. Uh, Point Du Hoc was effectively a construction site on the 6th of June. There you see the, the steps of the uh, embrasure to reduce the funneling of shrapnel from outside. And now we're standing above uh, gun number four. The viewing platform above this, uh, this, this bunker is still open to the public and it gives this wonderful panorama of the site. Uh, exactly why the guns at Point du Hoc were removed by the Germans uh, and why the Allied High Command ignored reports from the resistance that they had been removed, well, we'll probably never know. But I believe that the high casualty rates here um, and uh, especially on the beach at Omaha were due in part to overestimating the enemy's firepower here at Point du Hoc. Um, the Navy warships kept a safe distance of over 10 miles from the beach when they unleashed their first inaccurate salvos. Um, the US Army Air Force employed high altitude bombers flying in from the sea to try to knock out the enemy guns, but all of their bombs overshot the beach. On Omaha Beach, not a single bomb, uh, Allied bomb, landed on Omaha Beach um, prior to the invasion on D-Day. Um, 27 of the amphibious Sherman tanks, we'll talk about them later, but 27 of those am amphibious Sherman tanks uh, bound for Omaha and launched at 5,000 yards from the coast all sank. So things might have been very different for Five Corps had they modified the plan based on the reports that the guns were not there at Point Du Hoc. However, this is um, not to discredit or make light of the actions and sacrifices made by the second battalion who will remain forever in the words of Ronald Reagan there inscribed on the monuments uh, just at the entrance to to the site uh, who will remain forever the heroes who helped end a war 
Okay, well, I'll have a look to see if we have any questions. I'll also have a sip of water. If you'd like to ask any questions or send a message, you can do to, uh, you can do so on the Facebook page. You do need to uh, be a, a follower of We Love Normandy to to uh, send a message. I've tried to to do that to limit the amount of spam that we get, and so far it seems to be working this evening. Um, so if you'd like to send in a question or a message, just uh, click on uh, like or follow We Love Normandy, and you'll be able to use the um, uh, the comment feature on Facebook. And if you're watching on the WeLoveNormandy.com website, you can send a chat by using the chat facility. Okay, um, I'll just take a quick look here. We have uh, Mark saying hello from Virginia Beach, Virginia. That's 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 great. Uh, we will be talking about the Bedford Boys, who uh, uh, of the 116th Infantry Regiment, who came from the small town of uh, of Bedford in Virginia. So I'm sure that will be of interest to you, Mark. And uh, good evening, uh, Joseph. Thank you for, for letting me know. And uh, great to see you as well, Steve from Indiana. So we've got plenty of people from the US. I know it's only just after lunchtime there. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Okay, well, before we go to Omaha Beach itself, um, I'll ask you the first of uh, today's uh, mini quiz questions on the theme of D-Day personalities. I'll give you the answers at the end uh, of the show, uh, so stay tuned. And whoever gets all three right soonest will get a special mention in dispatches next time. So here goes. Question one. A British Army commando uh, accompanied the Second Rangers at Point du Hoc. Uh, he was a liaison officer with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. Now he boasted that the German snipers couldn't shoot him as he always took three long strides followed by three short ones. Now, on the morning of D-Day, he suffered a head wound from a sniper's bullet. What was his name? So I'm looking for the name of the British Army commando who accompanied the, um, the, the, the Rangers at Point du Hoc. Good to see you, Robert. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, I wholeheartedly recommend uh, Robert's uh, a fantastic site, the Washington DC History and Culture, um, and uh, I, I, would, I would thoroughly recommend you to follow that uh, that site as well, Washington DC History and Culture. There's a shout out for you, Robert. Thanks for joining us tonight. Okay, and if you have just joined us, you're watching Virtual D-Day from We Love Normandy, and today we are at Omaha Beach. Please click like or share or subscribe on the website. It, really, really helps get the message to as many people as possible and all my broadcasts are free. So stay tuned for Saving Private Ryan, Omaha Beach and the first provisional US cemetery and the bugle call taps. That's all coming up, so stay tuned. Okay. Next, we're gonna go down to Omaha Beach itself uh, we're going to go to Dog Green Sector at the Veerville Draw. So let's go there. So this is the Veerville Draw, the first of five exits. I mentioned those five, the only, the, the only five exits off the beach. This is the first of five. On the right flank of uh, Five Corps Invasion Force, uh, the sand and shingles um, give way to the sheer cliffs that continue to Point du Hoc and beyond, but from here it's sand. And at this end of the beach, um, the, uh, the area was protected by two enemy strong points, strong point 72 and strong point 73, and some of the most ferocious firepower faced by the invading troops. Now, the German defences here included machine gun positions, mortars, 50 millimeter and 75 millimeter artillery, as well as an 88 millimeter pack gun. And the US troops got into their landing craft at about 4.30 a.m. and made their way across the choppy waters of the English Channel, underneath the barrage of shelling from the Allied warships that were attacking the coast as they made their way across in those landing craft. The first wave of troops arrived here at H hour 6.30 a.m. And it was here that Company A of the 116th Infantry Regiment, supported by two companies of the 2nd Rangers, 
were given their first taste of combat, suffering the highest casualties during the D-Day landings. Now, Able Company, Company A, uh, who were known thereafter as the Bedford Boys, were recruited mostly from the town of Bedford, Virginia, and 19 young boys from the town lost their lives in the first wave. I think we've got a photograph here of the 19 young lads of the uh, A Company of the 116th who lost their lives during those uh, early moments of the invasion on D-Day. Now, the regiment was part of the 29th Infantry Division, a unit which was formed from the US National Guard. The frontline commander on D-Day was Brigadier Norman Cota. Now, if you remember, or if you've seen the film The Longest Day, Cota was played by Robert Mitchum. And a monument to the 29th now stands on top of the 88 millimeter bunker and next to it there's a statue dedicated to the Bedford boys and we'll get a closer look at those shortly. But we will start here on the beach. And I can press the right button. We'll start here on the beach. Uh, between the shingle of uh, Dog Green Sector and the cliffs of Charlie Sector. Now this area, this part of the beach, was the location of the opening sequences in the film Saving Private Ryan. Now although the filming itself was done in County Wexford in Ireland, uh, the reason for that was, as we'll see, a lot of building construction has taken place since 1944 and Steven Spielberg needed a much less developed beach to, to, uh, on which to shoot those scenes. But uh, what I'd like to do uh, before, we get, before we climb the bluffs is to just play a few seconds of the, um, uh, of the, of the, of the beach scene in Saving Private Ryan. If you haven't already seen it, uh, the, the, the movie, this is, uh, this is quite, uh, it's quite moving, uh, very powerful and very violent, I have to say. So if you're if you're uh, sensitive about watching uh, the horrors of war on, uh, uh, on, the, on, the, on the screen, then uh, feel free to turn off for a couple of minutes, maybe go make a cup of tea and then come back to us. Anyway, but uh, when you look at my video here, uh, Dog Green today is so peaceful. Um, it's really impossible to imagine the living hell that it must have been for the first wave of troops right here 78 years ago. And, you know, frankly, Spielberg's film still uh, really conveys that better than any other uh, war film, in, in my opinion. So without further ado, and as I say, if you want to go and make a cup of tea now, please do. It's only going to last a couple of minutes, but we're going to we're going to run a few of those scenes from Saving Private Ryan.
So pretty harrowing scenes there from the opening sequences in Saving Private Ryan. Um, we could do a big section on the uh, discrepancies in the movie because some of the, uh, the events that you see in those, uh, those scenes are not factual. Um, it's, uh, and we can talk about that in the, in the Zoom platoon afterwards if you like. But as I say, I can't think of a better way of, 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 of uh, showing to you on the screen what this very peaceful looking area um, today looked like uh, on, the 1st of, on the 6th of June 1944. So we carry on, we're going to go and walk up the bluffs and see some of the bunkers uh, where the, the German defences were located. Uh, these are the shingles, I mentioned them before, they're, they're sort of um, uh, smooth pebbles about the size of your hand and up there on the ridge past the shingles you'll see um, an artillery position, a concrete uh, artillery position which we'll get a closer look at shortly. We're going to climb up past the shingles. You can see there'd be very, very little cover on the beach for the for the uh, American troops arriving here. And there you see uh, one of the two strong points here at uh, at um, Dog uh, Dog Green. It's well, strong point seventy three, Widerstandsnest seventy three. We're going to go and get a closer look at it. We will climb the bluffs here next to the Vierville draw, following in the footsteps of the rangers, uh, whose objective here was to destroy a radar station on the top of the cliffs at nearby Pointe de la Perse. This is the view from the bunker and the field of fire from the bunker that housed a 75mm cannon. Great view of the western end of Omaha Beach, but as we move higher, we get an, we get an even better uh, view of the beach. Uh, you can see the gun itself is pointing along the beach and not out to sea, as it was shown in the uh, in the Saving Private Ryan footage. So we'll take the trail up to the top of the bluffs. It's not um, a sheer cliff like at Point Du Hoc, but they are pretty steep. Uh, it's a pretty steep hillside and it runs the, the whole length of Omaha Beach with only five gaps through where people can, you could get vehicles or large numbers of troops through. Uh, the bluffs here are about 150 feet high and uh, over each ridge there always seems to be yet another ridge. It's actually, uh, it's quite a distance and even more bunkers as well. They're right at the top of the ridge next to the chalets there. You can see uh, the pillbox um, slit of um, an artillery observation bunker. So we'll, we'll make our way up there gradually. Now the vegetation um, uh, nowadays uh, here is this Japanese knotweed. Um, but uh, um, the vegetation was possibly uh, just as dense, even more dense on D-Day because the occupying German forces had encouraged in many places the growth of uh, gorse and seagrass and briar in order to camouflage the bunkers from Allied spotter planes and indeed the Navy ships. And here we get uh, an even better view of the English Channel. We're going to climb higher. Thank you for joining us Christine whose father landed on Omaha Beach and he said it was a lot worse than saving Private Ryan. Well, thank you very much indeed Christine. So we reach the top and uh, the uh, forward uh, artillery observation position. Now this would have accommodated um, an artillery observer whose job it was to spot targets down on the beach and radio the coordinates uh, of the target to the guns, to, to, to artillery guns that could be several miles south of the coast. And the view from here um, along the whole length of the western end of the beach is absolutely stunning as you can see. Now the concrete platform that you see there, uh, the, um, the observation platform uh, is, is relatively recent but the, the, the big slab of concrete that it attaches to uh, is part, uh, is all that remains here on Omaha of the artificial harbour uh, codenamed Mulberry A. Um, this huge, huge harbour was constructed between uh, just after D-Day and the 19th of June when a fierce storm caused irreparable damage uh, and sadly it was destroyed. 
Uh, another one, Mulberry B, in the British sector at Aramanche, was repaired, and much of that one survives to this day. So if you're planning a trip to Normandy, if you come here, do go to Aramanche and see the remains of the Mulberry Harbour. It's an incredible site. Uh, 77, 78 years on, it's still there, uh, and you can, uh, you can even walk out to parts of it at low tide. So we'll go down uh, to Strong Point 72, the other of the, of the two Strong Points. This side of the bunker, as you can see, is now used as somebody's garage. Um, but it was previously a double slit uh, artillery bunker that housed a 50mm anti-tank gun. Now, as we go around to the other side, you can clearly see the opening or the embrasure. And somewhere I have... Uh, there we go. Um, an archive photograph of this very bunker, uh, taken a couple of days after D-Day. As you can see, there's an Allied barrage balloon um, perched on the roof of the bunker. And there it is today. Um, now the gun, as with all the bunkers here, is oriented along the beach, uh, unlike in the Saving Private Ryan footage, um, and it's not pointing out to sea. I'll pause the video there to show you the direction of fire. That's the direction of fire of the gun. And this gives the gunners, the German gunners, the advantage of what's called flanking fire or enfilade fire. And this enables them to send shells along the line of the advancing troops and affords them a far greater and more deadly hit rate. It also means that the gun itself is protected from Navy shelling by several feet of concrete on the seaward side. And here we see the statue dedicated to the Bedford Boys, Company A of the 116th. The troops had been ordered to advance without stopping to assist wounded comrades. That was a job for the combat medics. Um, but of course, many did drag their fellow soldiers out of the surf and up the beach. And behind them there, you see the National Guard monument a huge granite structure that commemorates all of the National Guard units in World War II. Over 400,000 National Guardsmen participated in the conflict, and it's a sobering thought that for those who arrived here on D-Day, it was the first time they'd ever experienced enemy action. The quotation there, and I'll read it to you, um, from uh, uh, General Eisenhower. I hate war as only a soldier who has lived it can. Yet there is one thing to be said on the credit side. Victory required a mighty manifestation of the most ennobling virtues of man. Faith, courage, fortitude and sacrifice. General Dwight D. Eisenhower, June the 10th, 1946. Now, below the monument is the bunker itself. It has uh, uh, an 88mm pack gun. We'll swing around and go and have a look inside the bunker. There you go. The artillery piece is still in place. Again, aiming not out to sea, but along the beach and towards our next destination, which is the D3 draw. Um, on uh, dog, uh, dog Red Easy Green at Les Moulins. Again, there you see the, the field of fire pointing along the beach. By the way, I filmed, <laughs> filmed this section from the vehicle to give you an impression of the size of the scale of Omaha Beach. I mentioned already that it's four miles of sand from, uh, from, from end to end. Um, today we're only going to cover one half of Omaha Beach, um, uh, which, uh, uh, which, as I say, is four miles from Charlie Sector to Fox Sector. Uh, next month we'll cover the other half of the beach um, uh, in uh, February, on the 9th of February. So look out for that one. And before we go to the D3 draw, I'm going to check if you've uh, sent me any questions or any comments. Um, if you do have any, please. Uh, 
either put those in the comments on the Facebook page or use the chat facility on the WeWork Normandy website. Okay, well, good evening John, thank you for joining us. And Elizabeth, I know you've, you, you're answering the questions. I'm getting some questions uh, to the three, answers to the three question quiz already, so thank you very much for that. And uh, Maureen, great to see you. And I know I did have a question here. Um, MC Morton asking what time was the second wave on Omaha Beach? Well, the second waves came in shortly after the first waves. It was chaotic. Um, and uh, the German firepower, let me just pause that there. The German firepower that you're asking about was uh, still largely intact for the second wave. So the second waves faced a similar amount of resistance as the first waves. And uh, uh, for most of the morning on Omaha Beach, it was um, the, the, the German defenses were intact and still firing. Okay, well, uh, I have another, quest another question for you as part of the three question quiz. This is question two. What was the surname, uh, this is an easy one I guess, but what was the surname of the four brothers, two of whom were killed in action in Normandy, who inspired the story of Saving Private Ryan? Now there'll be a bonus point or bonus points uh, if you can tell me why Private Ryan's real name might have seemed unsuitable for the film character and why the name Ryan was actually chosen. So. What was the surname of the four brothers uh, who inspired the story of Saving Private Ryan? And if you can tell me why they chose Ryan and why they didn't use the guy's real name, that'll be a bonus point. And if you've just joined us, you're watching Virtual D-Day from We Love Normandy. And today we are on Omaha Beach. Please click like or share or subscribe on the website. As I've said already, but I'll repeat it. It really, really helps to get the message to as many people as possible. All my broadcasts are free. So stay tuned for the answers to the quiz uh, and the third question of the quiz and stay tuned for the first provisional US cemetery and the bugle call taps which are both coming up. Okay so now we are at the D3 draw. Uh, called Les Moulins right in the middle of Omaha Beach Uh, and this is where the majority of tourists arrive, especially those traveling by coach or bus. You can see that the parking area is there. The D3 draw is on the boundary of Dog Red Sector and the inappropriately named Easy Green Sector. And here two companies of the 116th Infantry Regiment landed along with the 5th Rangers Battalion. Now, as with the other sectors on the beach, wind and sea currents, as well as general confusion, led to several units converging here under withering fire from the German 75 and 50 millimeter guns of strong point 68, which uh, I think we have a, a map of here. There you can see the strong point marked in red at the D3 draw. Um, as well as the guns, um, there was an anti-tank ditch hundreds of yards long, which blocked the exit entirely. So what you can see below there is the signal monument, and we'll get a much closer look at it. Uh, that pays tribute to both of the divisions that landed on Omaha Beach, but this sector was assigned to the 29th Infantry Division, the blue and grey. And here's their insignia, named after the blue uniforms worn by the Union forces and the grey worn by the Confederates during the American Civil War. And this is because Unusually, the 29th recruited from both Confederate and, uni uh, and um, Union states. Now, the monad symbol, or the yin and yang that you see there, symbolizes the unity and peace during the Reconstruction era after the Civil War. In overall command of the 29th Infantry Division was General Charles Gerhardt. Uh, uh, he went on to lead his troops to liberate the city of Saint-Lô, which is uh, near where I live, on July the 18th, 1944. It's only between 20 and 30 miles from, from the coast to the city of Saint-Lô, but uh, the, the, the ferocity of the fighting during that period and the Battle of the Hedgerows, etc., 
meant that the troops were only going to liberate Saint Lo five or six weeks after D Day. Gerhard's first wave regiment, the 116th, as we've mentioned earlier, suffered extremely high casualty rates. Uh, the ineffective pre invasion bombardment meant that most, if not all, the German enemy gun positions were firing on the morning of D Day. And to make things worse, the armoured units, uh, the tanks, they arrived too late to support the first waves of troops. Uh, they were supposed to be supported by 112 Sherman tanks from two tank battalions, 64 of which were the amphibious duplex drive uh, tanks that should have sailed, effectively sailed to the beach um, from, the, uh, from, the, from, the, from the landing craft out to sea. Now, due to the heavy swell, you can see one there being deployed. Now, due to the heavy swell uh, of the sea and a decision to launch the tanks from 5,000 yards out, 27 of them sank. Only two made it to the beach and the remaining tanks had to be brought into shore on the landing craft uh, too late to support the first waves of troops. So here we are at Les Moulins. If I can run that, past this nice Willie's Jeep, and what we're looking at there is the Signal Monument. Uh, it's one of nine along the 50 miles from Utah Beach to Sword Beach, and uh, the first one was constructed in 1949. I think we have a photograph of the first one being constructed back in 1949 and they all follow the same basic design which some people think resembles uh, the prow of a ship or the smokestack of a ship um, or perhaps a wave. The inscription on this side on the eastern side relates to the first infantry division whose sector it faces and on this side you have the uh, insignia of the 29th Infantry Division and the 116th and 115th Infantry Regiments. Uh, I'm not sure if you can pick it up, but the, you may just be able to pick up the sound of the halyard ropes rattling on their flagpoles. It's a familiar sound on the windy D-Day beaches. So next we're going to go down the steps and onto the sand. And here we see the Brave Ones Monument created in 2004 for the 60th anniversary by the French sculptress Annie Law Bannon. I think I have a picture of her here in front of this uh, incredible structure. It was uh, um, intended to be a temporary structure. I don't believe they had permanent planning permission to, to, to keep, the, uh, to keep the, 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 the sculpture there, but it's become so popular that uh, it's remained there now um, for what's that, 18 years. Um, so when you come to Omaha Beach, do stop off here at Les Moulins and have a look at the, uh, the, the Brave Ones monument, especially at high tide, because at high tide the sea washes up uh, as far as the base of the monument. Um, the, uh, the, the, the sculpture, as I say, is uh, called uh, Les Braves in French, which is often translated as the Braves but that sounds a bit too much like an American football team to me, so I call it the Brave Ones. Uh, it's 15 yards across and 10 yards high. Uh, it's a group of three um, steel, uh, metal structures that represent hope, freedom and brotherhood. And I mean, the first one there that you can see, hope, the, uh, the blades, I guess, the blades seem to reach out to the, to the clouds. Um, in the second one, uh, called Freedom, which is the tallest. They stand vertically straight and true. And in the third one there, Brotherhood, they seem to intertwine, support each other. Now, I guess everybody has their own interpretation of uh, abstract sculpture. Uh, but for me, when you go around to the side, um, go around to the flank, so to speak here, Freedom seems to be toppling like dominoes. And uh, Perhaps this symbolizes that although we take it for granted, freedom can be vulnerable and impermanent, something that the French discovered very much to their cost back in 1940. It's an absolutely beautiful day when we, when we filmed this segment, I think back in September 
of last year. Now, a few hundred yards west of the D3 draw is the location of the first US Provisional Cemetery. Uh, it was um, uh, began on the 7th of June, and uh, by June the 10th, there were 1,450 graves here. And there was a mass held on the 25th of June, uh, 1944, um, which I'll, I'll show in the in a VT clip. We'll, we'll have a quick look at the the marker that uh, that marks the the cemetery first. Somewhere temporarily to bury the bodies of those thousands of men who lost their lives on uh, Omaha Beach. And this is the film of the ceremony that took place here on the 25th of June of that year. So, the first temporary U.S. cemetery, the provisional cemetery on Omaha Beach. Okay, well, I have uh, one final question for you in the three-question quiz. Uh, we still have to do a wrap-up, and I still have to give you the answers to the quiz as well. So I'll just check if anybody's... Uh, I can see we've got a few correct answers to the first two questions in the quiz. So thank you for that, uh, Elizabeth, and others. And um, yeah, I have one. This, this is question number three then. Um, to complete the uh, to complete today's quiz, what was the name of the Hungarian-born American war photographer who took these pictures, uh, these photographs known as the Magnificent Eleven, on Omaha Beach during the first waves of the assault? He was later killed in action during the war in Indochina. So I'm looking for the name of the Hungarian-born war photographer who took these photographs uh, during the first waves of the assault. Uh, he was um, killed in action in, during the war in Indochina. And I'll give you the answers to these shortly. So to summarize, Omaha Beach as uh, well as being the biggest of the five Allied invasion beaches, was also the bloodiest. Um, only the airborne troops dropped behind enemy lines by parachute or glider, uh, mostly in the middle of the night, uh, would suffer comparable casualty rates. Uh, among the first wave of troops from the 116th Regimental Combat Team, some sections suffered over 80% casualties. Now, we've considered today how the Allies may have been overly cautious about the enemy firepower in the Omaha sector, especially uh, the guns at Point du Hoc. And as a result, the initial air, navy and armoured support did not succeed in neutralising the German defences. The bunkers, well concealed in the cliffs and the bluffs, contained a deadly collection of weaponry. Uh, machine guns, uh, mortars, anti-tank guns, heavy artillery, including the dreaded 88 millimeters. And the Germans were outnumbered, um, perhaps by 30 to 1, but dug into the bluffs, uh, they had a huge tactical advantage. And by the end of the day, 1,400 American soldiers had been killed, thousands more had been injured. But individual acts of courage um, by the men and strong leadership from officers like Norman Cota 
resulted ultimately in victory. Now, today we focused on the western half of the beach, the Rangers and the 29th Infantry Division, the eastern half of the beach and the regiments of Big Red One, the 1st Infantry Division, are covered in a separate tour which I'll be hosting live next month on the 9th of February at 7pm Normandy time. Uh, we end that tour with a visit to the US Cemetery at Colville-sur-Mer, so uh, I hope you can join us on that one. Uh, now I'll be delighted to uh, check your comments and answer any further questions you've got um, and uh, I'll give you the, the answers to the three question quiz. But before I give you the answers, I'll just repeat the questions quickly for anybody who tuned in late and missed the first, uh, the first question or two. Question one was, uh, who was the British Army Commando who accompanied the Rangers at Point du Hoc? Uh, question two was, what was the surname, the family name, of the four brothers who inspired the story of Saving Private Ryan? And the bonus questions, why was Private Ryan's real name not perhaps suitable? And why was the name Ryan chosen? And question three was, who was the Hungarian-born American war photographer who took uh, the photographs, one of which you can see here, on Omaha Beach, known as the Magnificent Eleven. And uh, if you haven't answered, I don't have a, a, a winner this evening, feel free to email me the answers, uh, send me a, a, a chat on the members chat facility, um, and I'll announce the winner next uh, February, sorry, next month on February the 9th, uh, when we do the eastern half of Omaha Beach. So, question one. Um, uh, again, we've got some right answers coming in on the uh, on the on the uh, comments page on the on the Facebook page. Thank you very much, uh, MC Morton McMorton. Uh, question one: The British commando who accompanied the Second Rangers at Point du Hoc was Lieutenant Colonel Kenneth Trevor. Uh, he boasted that the German snipers couldn't shoot him as he always took three long strides followed by three short ones. And on the morning of D-Day, he suffered a head wound from a sniper's bullet. And I think I have a photograph here of Commando Trevor with a bandage on his head. And he's there at the bottom right hand side of the photograph, just above the virtual D-Day logo. Question, to, and I know somebody got that right. So, um, but uh, feel, do keep sending in the answers because it's the first person to get all three right. And there are bonus questions as well. So. Uh, if you haven't already um, tried your luck, then uh, then do send in your answers. Question two, the surname of the four brothers, uh, two of whom were killed in action in Normandy and who inspired the story of saving Private Ryan was, of course, and lots of people have got this right, Nyland, N-I-L-A-N-D. And for the bonus points, his name might have been unsuitable for the film character because he was known by his nickname Fritz. So his name was Fritz Nyland, and that would have sounded probably too German for film audiences. Uh, the name Ryan was chosen in homage to the author Cornelius Ryan, who wrote the book The Longest Day. And I know some of my um, uh, subscribers and followers will, will have, have got these questions right. And question three, the name of the Hungarian-born American war photographer. Oh, by the way, I have a photograph there of the Nyland brothers and uh, Frederick Nyland or Fritz Nyland is the one in the fourth panel that you see there. And so question, the last question, number three, the name of the Hungarian-born American war photographer who took those photographs, known as the Magnificent Eleven, is Robert Kappa. And I know people have also got that right. He was killed in action during the war in Indochina. And there's a photograph of the man himself. Now, if you'd like to take part in next month's quiz, uh, just click subscribe and you'll be able to view and download uh, previous virtual tours, including this one, and take part in the Zoom platoon. And if you've enjoyed the show, uh, please tell your friends and family and do mention it on social media. Please, please click like, share, subscribe. It really makes a difference. And if you'd like to make a contribution for today's free tour, you didn't uh, purchase a uh, ticket, then you can go to the virtual D-Day page on the website and click support us. 
You can follow We Love Normandy on Facebook and Instagram. If you're a subscriber, you can catch up and download today's footage and uh, the, um, the recorded uh, uh, footage from all of the tours that we did last year on the Watch Again page. If, as I sincerely hope, you can visit Normandy soon, have a look at the website at some of the fabulous properties that we work with and let me know if you're planning a trip and I'll put you in touch with a great uh, guide or tour with you myself if I'm available. My personal email is patrick at welovenormandy.com. So the Zoom platoon, as we call it, is about to start in a few minutes. Uh, the details are on the website for subscribers. Ju just uh, click on Virtual D-Day, then Zoom platoon. If you purchased a ticket or if you paid for a contrib for a, 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 um, a, a donation ticket for today's show and you did not receive, receive the Zoom details, just send me an email. I know uh, one, one or two people already have and I will be emailing you the Zoom details shortly. Uh, I'll, send, I'll send you a link to the Zoom meeting uh, in the next couple of minutes. So I'll see you on the Zoom platoon shortly. Otherwise, it's au revoir from me and see you very soon, I hope, in beautiful Normandy. Thank you and see you next time.